Hey guys, what's up? Uh, today we're going to be talking about a super important topic, which is the product requirement document or PRD for short. The PRD is the single most important document that a product manager can write. It lays out both the long term vision as well as the nitty gritty details of a product. It is used by many different teams for many different purposes. Before we dive right into it, I'll just mention the three topics that I'll be covering. Number one, I want to mention what a PRD is and why it's important. Number two, I want to talk about the template or what are the basic headings for a PRD to have. Number three, we're going to talk about what the do's and don'ts for writing a good PRD are. Now, before we go any further, I'll just, uh, I would just request you to like, share and subscribe to this channel because it helps me reach more people and end of the day, I'm trying to make good content. There are five important parts of a PRD. The first is the purpose. Number two is metrics. Number three is assumptions. Number four is requirement specifications. Number five is out of scope. Now I'm going to go through each one of these parts or headings and describe what should be included in them. Let's start with purpose. Purpose should answer a few questions. It should primarily be concerned with the business case. The business case outlines why you should build this product or what the problem you're tackling or opportunity that you're chasing is all about. It should get your team excited about building this product or feature and it should mention who you're building it for, who are the customers, why do they care about this, what can you achieve uh, by doing this. It should also mention how this product or feature fits into the broader organization. So this is really a chance to make the business case, to get the buy-in, to convince people to be excited about the product. So the purpose is really, you know, something to start with and something to spend some time on. The second part is success metrics. Success metrics is all about defining what winning looks like. And that is to say, what positive change would indicate that uh, this feature or product is successful? So is it increased users, increased engagement rate, uh, more time spent in your app? What is it? Define it. Even if you can't come up with a number, although I would strongly recommend that uh, a number be put, in, put there, even if you can do that, state the metrics at least, because it gives a direction of what winning looks like. And that's very important. So number three is assumptions. So here we'll unpack what assumptions we're making about user behaviors, business goals, technical constraints. I'll give you some examples for each of those. Uh, so for example, are our users more comfortable on mobile apps or do they prefer the browser? Are uh, for business goals, let's say, is our goal to increase revenue or increase user growth, right? There's a difference between the two. Is it to become profitable? In which case, you know, we'll focus on monetization or is it to, you know, grow our product by reaching more people? Um, so all of those things are assumptions that we need to state. Now, the important thing about this section is a lot of things, left, uh, a lot of things are usually left unsaid, but it's a product manager's job to kind of articulate or express why certain things are important. Assumption section, I'm basically Jake Asakurzi, I'm a Bolivici, Kon Dinish Gula, Amra, Chinta Kurenichi. So, for example, among their users, among the users are key tech savvy, Nakina, or a key Android, iOS app use Kurta Pare, Nakina, or a key browser use Kurta Prefer Kurin. All of these assumptions shape how we are building our end product. Are our users comfortable using the browser, or do they prefer downloading an app? Are our business go is our business goal to increase revenue, increase profitability, or increase user growth. All of these things are usually set, left unsaid, but it's important that we express them so that everyone is clear what we're trying to achieve, who we, who we have in mind, and in general, again, to give people more context. Number three is requirement specification. Now, 80% or you know, more of, your, of the length of your product requirement document will be about specifying the requirements. It's about defining the nitty gritty of how each of the different features will work. So there's a template that I'm going to be creating and I'll share it on my newsletter, which is the Build Bangla newsletter. You can subscribe there and I'll send it out probably end of this week from whenever this video is going to be released. And if you want it, subscribe here and it'll be on the mailing list. I'll just mention how I want to structure this part. I want to keep five different titles. In, so in the requirement specification section, I want to keep a table where I mention number one, the core capabilities. So this section is about explaining the core capabilities of the feature. And I'll usually keep something like a feature number, which I'll correspond to the Jira number. 
Jira is, by the way, the software I use. Number two, I'll keep the feature title. Number three, I'll mention some of the use cases, i.e. what in what context will this feature be used or what task will the user be trying to accomplish when they are using this feature. This really sets, you know, the context for the developer when making this. And if there are some gaps, then because he or she has an understanding of what the purpose of this feature is, they can ask me. So it's very important to, you know, kind of mention the use cases. And the fourth thing here is really showing some screens, showing some uh, mock-ups for what this feature will look like. It's one thing to describe in words, but it's like they say, the cliche thing, uh, a picture paints a thousand words. So you want to, whenever possible, show mock-ups so that developers, again, get more context. So again, uh, the requirement specification will outline each and every feature in detail. It'll describe how it'll work, what the use cases are, and whenever possible, we will include some mockups or wireframes so that we can give the team some context about what the user is trying to accomplish, how they'll interact with the product, and what the feature really needs to be. Uh, and when I say what it needs to be, I mean how it works, um, what the inputs and outputs of the feature should be, what metrics you want to collect, and all of those things, because unless it's articulated, it's hard to have a proper expectation setting with the development team. So we've talked about the purpose, we've talked about the success metrics, we've talked about assumptions we're making, we've now also talked about the requirement specification piece. Uh, again, re requirement specification is going to make up the bulk of our document. And in the requirement specification section, it's important to do a few things. Number one, we have to be very explicit about the core capabilities of our product or feature. That means what are the specific nitty gritty things that this product or feature needs to be able to do. So for example, um, after I sign in, there needs to be a pop-up banner uh, that welcomes me, right? Uh, so after I sign in, there needs to be a pop-up banner that says, welcome to this app. After I land on the page, there needs to be something that greets me. Hey, Fahad. These are all the things that are the behaviors that are expected, right? So these, need, these things need to be mentioned. Fourth thing that I want to add uh, to the requirement specification section is data that needs to be recorded. So at every stage, at every screen, there are some metrics that are recorded for the activity that's going on on, on the screen. Now, it's important that we mention in the PRD what events, what data should be collected at each and every stage so that the developers can put that event or that um, metric into the code. Unless it's recorded, we can't go ahead and find it and do run queries on it. The last part of this PRD, we've already talked about what things we are going to do, but it's also important to talk about what things we're not going to do. So the final part of this PRD is what are the things out of scope? So the things that are out of scope are things we have thought about. Let's say for the food delivery app, we've thought about the basic features. Uh, there's a home page, there are all these restaurants listed, there's the ability to order, but we have left things out, but we've thought about things like customized recommendations for you, um, or you know, express checkout. All of these things that we've thought out and things that are nice to have, but we'll do later, are left out of scope. I.e. we're not doing it now, but we might do it later. This out of scope section is very helpful because uh, it shows that, oh, we've put some thought into it. Oh, there are some plans to do it in the future. So there's some, uh, so as an engineer or as a technical lead, you should leave some room uh, within the building of this product so that this can be done in the future, but we're not doing it now. But by expressing it and putting it in the talk, you kind of can leave some room for some technical considerations to be made so that in the future, if you want to do it, you don't have to break apart the previous engineering sprint and you know kind of remake things right so it's very important to kind of define what things are out of scope there are a few things that i have not talked about but are important nonetheless the first is the release criteria i.e it's also important to mention uh, what what metrics you want to hit in terms of reliability or scale before you actually release this product so for example you could say that this product needs to support 1 million users concurrently right? It needs to have the capability to do that. Or you could say the latency for this product needs to be under 10 milliseconds, right? All of these features, so all of these criteria are helpful for who? These criteria are helpful for one group in particular, and that is the testing team. If you set some release criteria, the testing team will have a much easier time 
kind of setting some benchmarks or setting their expectations of what is acceptable or what is not acceptable. We could shoot for the moon and support, you know, millions of users. But if the expectation is that, you know, you'll have, let's say, 500,000 users, you should go ahead and uh, mention that in your release criteria so that QAs can test for specifically that. So the whole philosophy of the product requirement document is that you want to be as explicit as you can for both the engineering design teams as well as sales and marketing teams as to what this product is all about. And that's no different for the release criteria where you're kind of specifying what the reliability metrics need to be, what the scalability metrics need to be, how much uh, scale you expect to uh, reach and what this product needs to support and all of those things. So one other thing that I like to cover, but I usually keep in a separate talk is a rollout plan. Why is it needed? It's usually the case that we don't ship to all users at once, i.e. shop user ke amra ekshate product deena. It's usually the case that 5% of users get it first, we see whether everything is okay, everything is working as expected, and then we roll it out to more people. So stuff like that, as well as what the communications, what the marketing, what the distribution strategies should be is covered in the rollout plan. This is usually a separate document and I will try to cover it in a separate video. Let me know if you want to me to talk more about how to do a proper product launch or a rollout because there are a bu bunch of different moving parts. For example, marketing, rolling out while ensuring that the product is stable, which I could cover in that video. So let me know in the comments if you actually want me to cover that. So those are the five parts. It's all about the purpose, all about the assumptions, the metrics, and then the actual product specs, the specifications of how the product will work. And then finally, it's about what we're not doing. It's uh, the items that are out of scope. Finally, I want to leave you with some tips. Tips are going to be very short. If you want more tips, let me know. I can do a more elaborate video, but today I'm kind of tired to be honest. Um, but the tips are number one, do your homework. You should always do your homework. Uh, and what I mean is if you're trying to build a product, know the ins and outs, know the market, know your users, know what their problems are and what you're solving for them. Know this, communicate this, and finally repeat this because it's worth repeating and it's worth constantly being on the same page with your development team, with your marketing team and sales team about what you're doing, why you're doing it and who you're doing it for. So yeah, do your homework, know your shit and uh, definitely let others know what you have in mind. The other thing is be as metric driven as possible. That means defining what success looks like and putting a metric to it and ideally quantifying it. Tip number two is wherever possible, be data driven, i.e. if you have a success metric, for example, engagement rate, have a target that we want to increase engagement rate by X percent by doing this release. That helps, you know, set a benchmark for that you're shooting for. And then also it gives your team something to actually look forward to. So always do that. Um, those are the two tips that come to mind. And then number three, which I actually, this should be number one because it doesn't get said enough. You should circulate your document to everyone. This should be a public document within the team, of course, but you sh everyone should be on the same page. This should not come as a surprise. Anything that you're planning should be reviewed, scrutinized, debated before you build it. So the product requirement document should be shared with all teams. You should get buy-in from sales, marketing, anyone concerned so that they understand it. You should get their input, even if as the product owner, as the product manager, you're making the decision, you should get everyone's buy-in, everyone's input, because you will need their help to roll it out, to build it, and finally, to make it a success. So share it with everyone, get everyone's input, make your call, but share widely. You'll need their buy-in. You don't want anything to come as a surprise, so share it widely. With those tips, I will leave you for today. Let me know if you want me to cover any point in particular. I want to make a more detailed video, but today I'm kind of caught up in time. In fact, this video uh, is happening pretty late. Um, I just didn't find the time this week, but let me know what you guys thought. If you want me to cover any of the topics more deeply, let me know. Please like, share, subscribe, do all of those nice things because I'm trying to put out helpful content and I want it to reach more people. It helps me keep motivated and it's generally useful from what I'm uh, learning from the comments. So help us reach more people. Finally, I am recording this pretty late. Uh, let me know if you want me to cover any of the other points in more detail. And if you want the template, by the way, if you want the template for the sample PRD, just sign up to Build Bangla. Uh, just go to this webpage, drop your email address, and I'll make sure you'll get it by end of this week. So I'll, with that, I'll leave you for today and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.